Hello everyone, I'm Yuji Han. Welcome to In the Newsroom, where streams of news and information flow in each day. And we've just wrapped up a meeting where we decide on which stories we will be airing today, as well as the running order. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Boon Ilwan, who is in charge of gatekeeping and regulating the flow of the news. Well, Mr. Moon, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much for having me. Right. So um, you've been working with us for five months now already. Um, what can you tell us about your experience here in the newsroom? Well, I have to say that I, uh, I'm surprised at the number of sort of talented people in the newsroom. We have a lot of potential. We still need to build up a lot of experience in our newsroom, but we have great potentials. Right, so um, gatekeeping, some, for of, uh, some form of gatekeeping is necessary when it comes to journalism and you are in charge of that. And it really boil boils down to uh, news uh, value. What's your priority? Well, I don't think it is very different in Arirang from other news organizations. Uh, it's more or less the same. This news value, what's news for Reuters or CNN would be news for us. But being a Korean network. We, I think we'll try to have a Korean perspective. So I think that probably is the only difference. Uh, if there is an interesting thing happening for Korea, that probably will be our top news. Well, Arirang TV is a global broadcaster. And what role do you uh, expect Arirang News to play in the Korean society as well as in the global arena? Well, I think uh, uh, our viewers probably would be those who are interested in what's happening in Korea. So although we are trying to convey what's happening globally, we'll try to tell our uh, viewers that uh, uh, things happening in Korea, what's, imp what's important in Korea, and uh, we're trying to give some Korean perspective on our story. That sounds great. Well, Mr. Moon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So before we go and meet our very own reporters, let's go over to our Hwang Sung Hee for the rundown of some of the headlines this week. Hi Jihei, another busy, busy week for the reporters. This week, I think one of the biggest news was surrounding free trade agreements. There was the trilateral Korea-China-Japan one and the bilateral Korea-China FTA. So I think this is where I will begin the headlines for this week. The leaders of Korea-China-Japan agreed to hold FTA negotiations this year while Korea and China hold their first official round of free trade talks in Beijing. President Lee Myung-bak visits Myanmar, becoming the first South Korean head of state to visit the country since 1983. Hang is elected the new chairman of ruling Sanuri party, leaving him with the work of steering the party to victory in December's presidential election. And an update on North Korea's third nuclear test, that China is reportedly pressuring Pyongyang to abandon its plans for the test, while U.S. think tank says North Korea appears to have resumed building a light water reactor. The Korean government is increasing their support for entrepreneurs in their 20s and 30s by injecting millions to help cover their startup costs. And over in Europe, Greece fails to form a coalition government, reigniting the Eurozone debt crisis and sending jitters through the global financial markets. Amid the deepening political turmoil in Greece, new French President François Hollande pledges to work closely with German Chancellor Angela Merkel to pull the Eurozone out of a crisis. And back here in the nation, Korea's top finance officials say the Eurozone financial crisis will have limited impact on the nation's economy, despite increased volatility in Korea's financial markets. Well, Jihei, I don't know what kind of stories will keep us busy next week, but I'm sure all of us are ready for any kind of new stories. Well, this is all from me for now. I'll toss it back to you, Jihei. Okay, so Jinju, Hanu, Youngil, it's good to see you guys again. Hi, good to right, see you. Right, so now we are well into spring, which means, you know, warm weather and a, a lot of the events are taking place outdoors these days, which means quite a lot of traveling for us to do in the newsroom. So, Hanu, I hear that you went all the way down to Gwangju, mm -hmm. South Chola Province. So, how was it? What took you there? Well, there is a joint aerial drill between the U.S. and the ROK Air Force in Gwangju, and I had the opportunity to um, shoot one of their exercises. It's a two-week-long exercise, and on that particular day, they were doing a rescue mission, which is a newly introduced element in this year's Max 
uh, the exercise, Dub Max Thunder. The objective is to safely rescue a pilot from a stranded airplane. But instead of rescuing the pilot, the Korean Air Force will act as the enemy, representing the red team to prevent the blue team made up of U.S. forces from carrying out the rescue mission. The head of Korea's Air Operations Command, Park shin gyu meets and greets his troops and makes final checks to his F-5 fighter jet before taking off to assume command in the air. One by one, the jets take off from the runway on Gwangju's first fighter wing. In the past, a helicopter was used in rescue training missions, but it was unrealistic for a wartime situation since the enemy could easily destroy a helicopter in this scenario during a real war. This year's Max Thunder exercise is the largest and the longest since the training was first held in 2008. The two-week joint drill ends on Friday. Kim Han Ul, Arirang News, Gwangju. It was, a, it was an exciting experience because I was on a helicopter. Wow, so, that's awesome, helicopter. So uh, to travel to Gwangju, it takes um, several hours by car, but we took a helicopter from Seoul. Uh, that is awesome. And then we landed in Gwangju for about an hour and a half. So we lifted off at this unnamed island in the middle of the Han River, mm. which no one really knows about. Wow. And it's not, uh, it's, um, it's not open to civilians. So we were taken to this place and the helicopter just came out of nowhere. <laughs> so we all went on board and they closed the helicopter. It was very loud. I, 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 I'm assuming that you were the only uh, female reporter there yes. again. again. <laughs> I mean, do they give you special, uh, I don't know, treatment or? Well, this time around, they didn't give me any special treatment, no. but people, I can tell that they're watching their language <laughs> <laughs> and just watching what they say because, you know, there's like a lady here, so uh, they don't want to use any like rough language. So that was the only difference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> must have been fun. Um, and of course, President Yim Young Bak has been keeping himself extremely busy uh, this week. Can you tell us more about it, Jinju? Yes, he left for Beijing on Saturday for the trilateral talks with China and Japan. And after that, he visited Myanmar, um, which is a very historic visit since um, it's the first time that a South Korean president visited the country after um, there was a North Korean bomb attack in 1983. So. Um, Yes, he had a quite a busy week this week. President Lee myung bak met with Myanmar's opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi Tuesday, where the two stressed the importance of democracy. During a joint press conference following their 45-minute long meeting at a hotel in Yangon, President Yi praised Suu Kyi's continuous efforts to promote democratization and human rights in the Southeast Asian country. Later in the day, President Yi paid a surprise visit to the mausoleum of General Aung San in Yangon, the place where a deadly North Korean bomb attack targeting then-South Korean President Chun doo hwan killed 17 South Korean government officials in 1983. Meanwhile, Myanmar's President Thai Stein reportedly told President Yi during bilateral talks on Monday that he will no longer engage in any additional conventional weapons trade with North Korea and comply with U.S. Security Council resolutions. Oh Jin Ju, Adidas News. I think what was most noteworthy for me mm -hmm. personally was President Yi's appearance at the bomb site uh, mm -hmm. where he paid yeah. tribute to the victims. Mm -hmm. Was well, that, I don't know, sort of uh, decided prior prior to his visit? Well, meeting with Aung San Suu Kyi was decided um, prior to the visit, but I think um, the visit to that. Um, cemetery was um, decided the day before he made that visit. So because um, because of the security reasons, I think, um, they they were really um, putting this um, like on top secret, like even his visit to Myanmar and the visit to the cemetery, those were top secrets. So we couldn't release those, uh, any, any like small details of it, we couldn't l release it before he made the visit actually to those places. What was also noteworthy was uh, that uh, a Myanmar leader mm -hmm. uh, told 
um, President Yi that they, there will be no um, involvement in nuclear uh, activities in mm. relation to North Korea. Wasn't that the case? Well, um, President Yi requested um, to the Myanmar's president that they should stop any kind of transactions with North Korea, like regarding um, weapons or nuclear materials. And President uh, Myanmar's president agreed to that, and he um, promised not to engage in any um, additional um, conventional weapons transactions with North Korea or trade with North Korea. So I think that was a big accomplishment he made um, during his visit there. Let's move on to Myungil. Myungil, I mean, Hello. I think we haven't had a male reporter in this segment for <laughs> quite some time now, so yeah, welcome. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Missed you too. <laughs> I think um, sometime uh, within this week, uh, you had a session with us in the, uh, the news in depth uh, talking about smartphones. Uh, can yep. you tell us more yeah, about it? Yeah, well, I have it here, smartphones. That's, that's the buzz of this week, I think. And, um, like this Sunday, no, I was on work. Well, we reporters work <laughs> on weekends, so um, it started by this: the fact that starting next month, they'll be releasing all the major companies. Well, not major companies, but like the manufacturing companies will release wireless recharging devices for smartphones. So you have this device, you just put your smartphone on it, and it starts recharging, and that will be available in stores starting next week. And then the next day, when I came to work on Monday again, and um, there was this another official report by the telecom carrier saying that um, half of Korea's population now uses smartphones. According to a recent report by telecom service providers, 26 million people in Korea now have a smartphone. That's more than half the population. Among the three telecom carriers, more than 50% of SK Telecom subscribers use smartphones. Some 53% of KT's 30 million subscribers do, and more than 48% of LG U Plus customers are smartphone subscribers. Here at one of the major telecom stores, people are looking at the latest smartphones, asking more attractive package deals, or simply browsing the latest products. As one of the world's first countries to offer fourth generation or 4G mobile communication services last year, Koreans have access to ultra broadband high speed internet access, high definition mobile television, gaming services, and the latest apps. But I'm sure there are some people who are worried, especially parents, who yeah. are worried that, okay, uh, growing dependence on smartphones can lead to addiction. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think there are some problems that, you know, since smartphones are so prevalent these days, you know, maybe like it seems a lot of youngsters are actually getting addicted to like using smartphones. So, you know, it's good that we have some other kind of applications for our youngsters to use, but I guess we need some kind of, I don't know, like a security device in order to like sort of block them using some unwanted you know, applications that you know are on the list of the parents so oh I just saw some reports that since young younger students nowadays use a lot of smartphone mm. and these electronic devices their handwriting are getting worse oh. and they can't write and I remember That's like true. back in the days when I went to school we had to write everything down yeah, on everything the paper down and, and just write reports with handwritings but yeah Kids nowadays have really bad handwriting. Mm, well, that makes true. sense, actually. And, and, and speaking of de depending more on smartphones and addiction, I mean, even adults like us, uh, we c I mean, can you leave home without you know carrying a smartphone? A smartphone? No. Uh, exactly. I'll go back home, like even if that means I'll be late for work. <laughs> exactly. Oh, we are reporters, so we yeah. have a, a, an excuse. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think it's just uh, it's a scary thought, it's a daunting thought that people really they cannot do anything with. They feel they're agitated, and, and um, so this certainly is a, a problem that we, we should keep in mind, I think. But again, thank you guys for your contribution, uh, and yeah, keep up the good work. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>
My name is Yudian and I'm a new reporter here and right now I'm going out to COEX Convention Center to cover my very first story on the World IT Show 2012. This is, of course, my first time having my own press badge um, at this conference, so feels good, feels nice. Oh, I'm just looking around to get a sense of um, what kind of convention this is. Obviously the scale is much, much bigger than I thought it would be, so... Um, I was just gonna cover one um, TV company and I was gonna cover one of the communication um, mobile services company, KTRSDT. I'm just trying to figure out which, who to talk to to get an interview, so... Can I get a really short interview from you about what you think? Uh, there will be, there's a lot of Australian delegates around, so you'll find someone. Okay. Sorry about that. No, it's all fine. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> The camera reporter, who's much, much more experienced than I am, obviously told me interviews don't work like that. You have to go up to them and ask them, just like if you have a minute, can you just send out a short interview? Can, do you have time for a really short interview? I'm the ambassador, I think you should be asking me probably. So, uh, um, it's okay, the ambassador is totally fine. Korean technology is, and this is a very impressive venue with some very impressive new technology on display. Oh, Thank you so much. I'm learning that this is how interviews work. You have to go up to them with a mic, very enthusiastic, and ask them if they can have a really short interview. Uh, it's, I think so. I think it's going okay. I'm gonna go to the uh, research centers and see what they have for now since I cover the major uh, companies here. It's called the GTech Global Technology Exhibition in Korea, and I think um, research centers and college, like universities, come and showcase their uh, latest IT products. So I'm trying to cover that aspect, too, of the convention. And I just talked to the Future Robot Company. It's a, venture com it's a small venture company. Um, and so I think that would be interesting. On the spot, I'm coming up with what I want to say as my stand-up. I want to get it all revised before also I actually do the stand-up. So um, I'm calling my editors. Uh, and right now it's lunchtime, so it's hard to get a hold of them for now, but yeah. <laughs> a thinner device, a thinner device with the, so if you want a glimpse of the, of, oh, so it doesn't move, stand up your defense. Now most of these technologies are yet to enter the market, so if you want to get a glimpse of the future of the IT industry, visit the Coed Center this week. Yurian, Arirang News. Out of the whole day, this was the hardest part. My voice is almost gone because I've been practicing the stand-up part for like the whole day, but I'm really, really just relieved that this is over.
those are the news we are following at this hour. I'm Yu Jiehe. Have a good night. And I'm Sean Lim. Please join us again at midnight for more on Late Night Edition. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. Do you have any uh, suggestions as to what we can do uh, later in our newscast? I mean, this uh, yeah. news in this segment is really right. the highlight of our, uh, you know, our uh, news uh, lineup. So. I mean, you had some ideas, right? Um, I was thinking, um, we've heard quite a number of reports on uh, Korean entertainment industry, uh, the dark corners of it, you know, like the sexual harassment cases, the fraud and scams. So, and the government it's really is stepping up its game to um, really make sure that these trainees or uh, talent aspirants can um, roam free and, right. uh, you know, fulfill their dream right. uh, in a safe environment. A, a few years ago, I think the big controversy was the quote, quote, slave contracts, mm -hmm. where you had a contract for seven to even 20 years with just one entertainment company. I think the government stepped in to curtail that. So it'd be interesting to see how effective that has been. Right. Because, you know, as, as far as I can see now, it's still the same big, um, you know, entertainment system. Although with the rise of all those audition programs, it, it seems as if really there's right. people with talent that are bypassing mm -hmm. um, that system. So that'd be very interesting to see. Well, uh, there is a professor from Harvard that is going to be coming in uh, to Korea to do a special uh, talk, and I was hoping that we can get an interview with him. And he, his name is Michael Sandel, and he wrote this book recently, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And his main premise is that we have become so market-oriented that it, it's not just a piece of economics anymore. It's into our society and we're buying and selling things that in other generations they would never think of buying or selling like you know like organs or body parts or. Oh, is that the reason why he's here in Korea? I think he's he's going to be here at a, with a think tank so he's going to be talking I think about a wide range of issues but I thought it'd be interesting to see if he could give us a perspective of, of Korea since it's uh, more of a, a younger market economy like he could probably see like similarities and also differences and maybe even give us like warning signs of what maybe not to do. So did you take a uh, you know a little peek at the, uh, what he wrote? His Who book, his yeah, I listened to his book. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> Audio book, <laughs> yeah, on the smartphone. So uh, very, very interesting. He goes through a lot of case examples of places where we have become so comfortable with selling off rights um, to things. Mm -hmm. And that may not be the best you know, way to go. I thought that might be a good um, uh, in-depth coverage. But yeah, we've been like experimenting with a lot That's of this in-depth. Right. It's been two months now already. Yeah. Uh, I think we make uh, I don't know. We, we've been trying this and that, experimenting with these uh, ideas, and I think so far so good. I mean, we could do better. Yeah, definitely. There's always room for improvement. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Great. I don't know if that's very interesting. <laughs> Another busy, busy week. <laughs> For the reporters. <laughs> <laughs> the own reporters, let's go over to our Hwang Sung Ki for the run.